So it is very important for you to prepare yourself for you to prepare yourself on Sunday. It is very important for you to prepare your heart, to prepare your heart, to prepare yourself to come into the sanctuary, to come into the presence of God. The church is not a social place. The church is God's sanctuary. The church is the place where the presence of God dwells. The church is the place where the rivers of God flow. The church is the place where the wisdom and the knowledge of the understanding of the Lord is imparted. So it's very important for every one of us to prepare our hearts and prepare ourselves before the Sabbath, before the Sunday comes. Honour is very important. To honour the Lord means you prepare yourself for His manifestation. You prepare yourself to hear Him. You pre prepare yourself to receive from Him. All oh, that is very important. We have to understand that Christianity is not a convenience door. It's not a drive through It's not that you just drive through and grab whatever you want. We have to understand that God sees the heart. God looks at the heart. He's the one that told us not to cast our pearls before the pigs because they are pearls. And in the same way, God will not cast his pearls before anyone who is too busy to hear him or who is too distracted to hear him or whose heart is not even there to hear him. It is one thing to ask God to lead you. It's another thing that you commit yourself to his guidance. We love to have God to lead us. And we think that the problem is not, we think that the problem is in not hearing the voice of God and we seek his voice, we seek his presence. No, that is not the problem. The problem is not in God not speaking to you. The problem is not in you cannot find the voice of God. The problem is in whether you are committed to get his guidance and committed to follow his guidance. That is the groundwork, the foundation of Christianity. And God has commissioned me, God has commissioned me to raise up a people unto him. He has commissioned me to raise up a people unto him. Not just to gather followers of Jesus, but to raise up a people unto him that would receive his heart and receive his power and do his work. It's going to be a quality people. It's going to be a quality people. It's going to be a quality people. I know my assignment. I know my assignment from the Lord. I know that I'm not good at just gathering whosoever. I'm good at gathering those whose hearts are committed. I'm good at gathering those whose hearts are devoted. I'm good at gathering those who want to hear God and live His way. Hallelujah. The message that God has put on my heart for you this morning is manifesting God's victory in your world. Manifesting God's victory in your world. I've been teaching on hearing, so make sure that you get it. You can download it from the internet. You can even write and ask for a DVD or a CD. I've been teaching on hearing God, and uh, last Friday we had an awesome Bible study on the second pillar of your destiny, which is the leading of the Holy Spirit. The first pillar is consecration. The second pillar is having the leading of the Holy Spirit. I'm thoroughly convinced that there is an anointing for every service. Of course, you can download it. Of course, you can go online to listen. But there is an anointing for every service. I believe that with all of my heart. Amen. Amen. Because God will not give something to your shepherd 
to your pastor if he's not in the business of blessing you. You have come not to hear me. You have come to receive the message that God has for you. Amen. The commandment that God gives to me is to just keeping the grass green. Just keeping the pasture green. Because when the pasture is green, the sheep will be healthy. The sheep will be prosperous. And more sheep will come. My responsibility is to please my master, the one who drafts me into his army. And your responsibility is the same thing, is to hear your shepherd. The word of God says, Jesus himself said, my sheep hears my voice. So that is your commitment. And where your commitment is, your success will be there. The people's victory manifesting God's victory in your world. You have a world that you carry. You have a world that you carry. Your world includes your family. Your world includes your friends, your community, the people that you touch, the area that you function in, your school, your workplace, your university, your friendship circle, your social circle. That is your world. And it is the will of God for you to manifest the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ in your world. God's will is victory, not failure. God's will is victory and not defeat. God's will is prosperity and not poverty. His will is for you to prosper. His, for, his will is for you to win. His will is for you to do well. His will is for you to be healthy. And where the will of God is located, the success of God will be obtained. You locate his will and you obtain his victory. They are together, hand in hand. Jesus said, if you ask anything according to my will, it shall be done unto you. So the key is locating the will of God in your world and in your life. And be willing to pay the price until you see the victory manifest. There are too many Christians that have fallen along the way because they're not willing to pay the price. I'm not talking about the price of sickness and disease. I'm not talking about the price of poverty, but I'm talking about the price of commitment. Amen. The commitment to God, the commitment to holiness, the commitment to hearing the voice of God, the commitment to serve the Lord, even when you don't feel like it. Amen. Your victory is in the place that is above only. And you stay above. Uncontaminated, uncorrupted, undefiled by the world that is around you. Because you are called to be the light of the world. That means you have to be above the world to shine on it. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to look at the people of the Bible. The Bible is God's word, God's manual for success. There are two kinds of success. The success of the world that has a lot of sorrow, isn't it? If you like, you can chase after that kind of success. That kind of success has a lot of sorrows. That kind of success is temporary. That kind of success will not take you to heaven. That kind of success will not give you divine health. That kind of success will not give you the fullness of joy, will not give you honor, nor glory, nor immortality. Yes, there is a success that the world can offer you. Satan himself offered Jesus three times the success of this world. But Jesus, being the wisest man who has ever lived, he rejected Satan three times. And that's what we have to follow in the footsteps of our Savior. Every time when the devil comes to tempt you, you say no. No matter how many times he tries to come, you say no. You say no, and you say no, and your success is guaranteed. The success of heaven is eternal. The success of heaven is glorious, is victorious, is virtuous, is holy, is eternal. You have to commit yourself to obtain that kind of success. There is a price that you have to pay. There is a commitment that you have to make. There are things that you have to say no to. There are people that you have to say no to. 
There is a time that you have to say yes to. When the Holy Spirit wakes you up in the morning. Morning by morning, he wakes you up in the morning. He has given you the year of the learned. You have to wake up to his voice. You have to wake up to his voice. You cannot put sleep above the voice of God. No matter how sleepy you are, when you hear the master's calling, you wake up. Even when it's in the middle of the night, when your body is saying, I'm tired, I need to sleep. When you hear the master's calling, you get up. And the one who calls you, the one who wakes you up, will energize you with no problem. He's the one who gives you energy to begin with. I mentioned last Sunday, the creation of God is so wonderful. Whatever God has created, you don't need to find a battery in it. Have you ever found a battery in a tree? Have you ever found a battery in yourself? But whatever man has invented or discovered, you will find a battery in it. I mean, the phone that we like, the cell phone that we like so much, what does it have in it? A battery. My sound amplifier, what does it have in it? A battery. And if you compare the works of man with the works of God, the works of God is powerful because whatever he does, he puts life in it. Even the trees, the fish, the animals, the flowers, everything has got life in it. What is so particular about you? What is so awesome about you? You have life in it. And those that have no God, they don't understand. That's why in communist China, they can just kill anybody. They ordered the whole tank. They ordered the whole fleet of tanks into Tiananmen Square and killed all the students. They were protesting there. Why? Because they don't understand that people are wonderfully and fearfully made. The reason why go, people go to abortion, they go to abortion, they, they don't understand the value of a person. They don't understand the value of a baby. They don't understand the value of a fetus. People, a man, a woman, a child, a baby, who is made in the image of God. I shared in the parenting session yesterday, you are not just a parent who loves your children. You are holding the life in your hand. It's not just a baby. The baby will grow up to be a toddler, to be a child, to be a teenager, to be a young adult, to be an adult, to be somebody's mother, somebody's father, somebody's grandmother, somebody's grandfather, and all the way to eternity. You have to understand the value of a person. And when you understand that, you have no problem understanding and receiving God's love for you. You won't have any problem understanding why God loves people so much. Because He sees the potential in you, He sees the value in you more than you can see for yourself. And you don't have to worry about God not healing you. He will heal you. Sickness does not come from God. God never puts sickness on anybody. That's why you don't have to beg Him to heal you. It is, it, it's His will to heal you. It is never His will to withhold healing from you. You just have to tread, trample on snakes and on scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing, 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 no one, nobody, nothing can by any means hurt you. You understand God's love for you, you have no problem believing God for protection. You're understanding God's love for you, you have no problem believing God for prosperity. It is God's will for you to be, he to be healthy, it is God's will for you to be wealthy. Heaven is rich. Heaven is rich. The kingdom of God is rich. It is never poor. It is not the will of God for any of us to be in lack. Can we say Amen. You have to stand strong in the will of God, knowing that whatever is not the will of God, you have the right and you have the power to say no. 
Can we say amen? amen? Hallelujah. If you look at all the Bible, if you look at all the heroes in the Bible, look at the heroes in the Old Testament, look at the heroes in the New Testament. They are all victorious. They are all victorious. They are winners in Christ Jesus. They are indeed above and not beneath the head and not the tail. Look at Abraham. Even when he was about to offer his only son Isaac, he thought that he would offer his only son Isaac to obey God. He did not know that God was only testing him. And when he passed the test, the glory came. All the generations after him were blessed. They became a people of God, a chosen people. And they became more than conquerors, and everywhere they went, the Gentiles were afraid of them. I want you to understand that in your, t in your life as a Christian, there will be tests. There are tests in my life. There were tests in your life. There were tests in my life. Your spirit would be able to pick it up. Your spirit will be able to pick it up. That is a test. I am a university graduate. I am from Hong Kong, and I'm very good at passing exams because our success in Hong Kong depended on passing exams. And when I was about to sit for an exam, I made sure that I passed my exams. How did I do that? I knew that it's impossible for me to study at all. You're kidding me? Five years of study and your future is determined by one exam. <laughs> Five years of study and your future, in my days, was determined by one exam. And then two more years of study and then your future was determined by that exam. I knew how to pass my exams. How? I would guess what the questions would come up in my exam. I would know. I would know what questions would come up. I would know. And I would prepare myself to answer those questions. When you read your Bible from Genesis to Revelation, there is no way that you can finish them all in one day. There is no way for you to remember every word in your Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But you can remember the principles in the Bible. And most important of all, you have the Holy Spirit on the inside that will tell you what the exam questions are, what the tests are about. When you are about to go through a test, He will tell you you are being tested for faithfulness. He will tell you, you are being tested that you don't put your eyes on people, that you have to put your eyes on God. He is the counselor. He is the wonderful counselor. And he wants you to pass the test so that you can be promoted to a higher glory. So that you can be one of the commanders and one of the generals for the army of the living God. Can we say amen? Do you know that the word command is built into the word commander? If you don't know how to obey God's commands, you will never be a commander. If you don't know God's commandments, how can you obey His command? So you need to know His commandments to obey His commands, and you will be drafted as a commander in Christ Jesus. And you said to me, Pastor Dora, but I don't need to be a commander. Excuse me, I think you're wrong. You need to be a commander concerning your health and healing. You need to be able to command your physical body to obey the will of God when it comes to health and healing. You need to be able to command your children so that your children will not be enticed nor seduced by demons of sin. You need to be able to command at your workplace so that you will prosper. You need to be able to command yourself so that you can be quiet and hear the voice of God. You need to be able to command your thoughts that come to you. You need to be able to command the emotions that try to stir up a storm in you. You need to be able to command over the situations and circumstances in the life of your children so that they stay protected in the midst of a wicked generation. 
You need to be able to take command over your marriage so that you and your spouse stay together, happily married, fulfilling God's calling for your life. Can we say amen? Thank you, Jesus. Victory is very, very important. You don't have an option. It is not for us to choose whether to win or to fail. Our option is win, win. We are in a win-win situation. Can we say amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So when you look at the people in the Bible, you notice that they are all called, like Moses, Joshua, Esther, Daniel, Mordecai, they were all called. They were called, they were separated, they were consecrated. And what did they receive? The favor of God. Your success is in God's favor. Your success is in God's favor. Not in your toiling, not in your sweating. Not in your intelligence. Not in the wicked scheming. Your success is in God's favor. Hallelujah. And what else did they have? They have the empowerment, the endowment of the Holy Spirit. The anointing came on them. The anointing came on them. Even as a, even as a parent, you need God's endowment. You need God's authority to be able to raise up your children unto God. Life is no game. Life is very serious. And the clock is ticking all the time. Like, I remember I saw Jenny and Angel when they were very little. Like, very, very little. Dylan and Trisha were playing with them in Sydney when we first came to Australia. They didn't even remember now. But they were very, very little. And look at them, they're all young adults. Time goes so quickly. I still remember when I first saw Jennifer and when I first saw Cindy and Matthew, they were all so little, little ones. Little ones running around with two, what do you call them? Two ponytails. Time is very fast. Time is called one of the mysteries in the Bible. There are many mysteries in the Bible, but uh, that's not my sermon today. I want, to, I want you to look at um, Judges chapter 6 with me. Judges chapter 6, verse 13 to 16. The key is that you can go through the tunnel of time and be more and more gl glorious, more and more glorious as the times go by. How many of you like that? How many of you like to grow more and more glorious as the times go by? Lift up your hands. The world talks about aging. We can talk about getting better and better and better as the days go by. Hallelujah. Would you like that? Would you like that? Amen. Would you like your children and your grandchildren to inherit the grace of God on your life? Would you like that? Come on, a big amen. amen. Hallelujah. You know what I like best? I love my daughter and my son, Dylan. I love them. I mean, I would do anything for them. I'll give them anything. But above all else, I know the best for me to give to them is the grace of God. Amen. How, many, how many parents here would say that? The best that you can have is the grace of God, the presence of God in your life. I would not be where I am, who I am today without the grace of God. I want you to know, for those of you that don't know me, I, I was an orphan. My parents were so poor. They had to give me away to somebody who is equally poor. <laughs> and in fact, she was so poor, she had no way to raise me up. She had to work in a restaurant. And, uh, and I was given to another family to take care of. And I had to sleep in a room that was just, you know, this big, the, big, the size of a, of a bed. I have no chair, no table. You just quickly just hop to your bed and there you do your study. So I have to tell you that poverty is not from God. It is not the will of God for you to be poor. It's not the will of God for you to be in lack. It's not the will of God for you that you want to buy, a, you want to buy some clothes and you have no money. You want to buy milk powder for your, for your baby and you have no money. You want to buy some furniture from your house and you have no money. No, that's not the will of God. God is good. God is good. God is good. He is good in all things. The goodness of the Lord. David said, I would have fainted unless I have believed in the goodness of the Lord. Is it in heaven? No, in the land of the living. 
You need to believe in the goodness of the Lord in your life, when you are alive on earth and, of course, in eternity in heaven. Amen? Start using your faith now. Start using your faith now. Start using your faith now and see God's provision. See God's grace manifest for you. Can we say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'm teaching you the how-tos. There are how-tos in God. I was a Catholic for many years. And I was a good Catholic. I sang in the choir. I was a Catholic, yet I did not know God. I heard the priest's sermon. I was a good Catholic. I was in church, in the chapel every Sunday. But my life was not happy. I was depressed and I had nowhere to go to. I did not know. I prayed, but I had no answer. I prayed, but I had no power. I had a religion. I had a form of godliness, but I did not have the power thereof. Christianity is not a religion. It's not a religion. It's not an empty shell. Christianity is the power of God. It's the life of Jesus. The reason why Jesus came is that he came to give you his life. Jesus came to give you his life for whosoever will. He said, whosoever wants my life can take it. That's Christianity. That's Christianity. It's the life of Christ coming into you. Amen. And start manifesting for you. Can we say amen? And neither is the Bible a religious book. The Bible is not a religious book. The Bible is not a religious book. You know, religion tried to put the Bible in a golden shelf all by itself. Nobody's allowed to touch it. Only the priest could understand it. It was written in Latin. Nobody could understand Latin. Latin is a dead language. The Bible was written for us to understand, for us to read, for us to pray, for us to confess, for us to live. It's the living word. Jesus is the living word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the word in the flesh of man. Hallelujah. And he said, unless you eat of my flesh. What was he talking about? He was not talking about being cannibals. He said, unless you eat of my flesh. What was he talking about? He said, unless you have my word in you. Unless my word becomes food to you. Becomes food to you. Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. What is he talking about? He's not talking about sucking blood. He's talking about his spirit. He's conceived of the Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit himself. He said, unless you partake of my Spirit, have my Spirit in you, ministering to you, speaking to you, talking to you, you have no part in me. So Christianity is a living communion with God. Hallelujah. Amen. Go with me to Judges chapter 6, verse 13 to 16. And I'm breaking the bread. I'm breaking the word of God so that the word is no longer just cold religion to you. The word is no longer um, impenetrable to your eyes and to your heart anymore. Judges chapter 16, verse 13 to 16. And Gideon, who is one of the Bible heroes, but... At this time, he's not a hero yet. And Gideon said unto the angel, unto God, okay, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked unto him, looked upon him, and said, Go in this way your might, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? And he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall smite the Midianites as one man. Look at this man called Gideon. He's a natural man, you know. What do you call it in Australia? What do you call a man? A bloke, right? 
Huh? A block. A block. <laughs> so he's a block. <laughs> Just an ordinary man. But, you know, his father, his, his grandfather, his forefathers, you know, they were all Jews, Israelites. And then um, God appeared to him. And God spoke to him. And God said to him, I want you to do something for me. And he said, oh my Lord, <laughs> you must be kidding. You're asking me to deliver the Israelites from our rulers? You must be joking. We are slaves now. We are nobody. We are secondary citizen. Who do you think we are? We are nobody. Yes, I've heard of the stories, you know. I've heard of how you delivered the Israelites through the hands of Moses and through the hands of Joshua from Egypt. But those were fairy tales. Those were the good old days. No, those were historical accounts. If God, you are really with us, where are the miracles? Where are the miracles? Where are the signs of victory? We are now victorious. We are in captivity. We are slaves. We are second-class citizens. How many of you have felt like that sometimes in your life? Come on, be honest. An ordinary man would say like that. A natural man would say like that. A natural man looks at what's around you. A natural man looks at what's happening right now. But God does not look at you like that. And if you look at the reply of God, look at how he replied Gideon. He said, Go in this your might, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? I want you to understand that perception is very, very important. Perception is very, very important. I'm looking at you from up here, and my picture of you is different from you because you are seated where you are and you cannot see yourself. When God looks at you, He sees Christ in you. When God looks at you, He sees the Holy Spirit in you. When God sees you, He sees that you are made in His image. He sees you as somebody. You are not nobody. You are somebody. Can we say amen? It doesn't matter how old you are. Age is irrelevant when it comes to the power of God. Age is irrelevant when it comes to doing the assignments of God. Gideon had a very poor image of himself. He had a very, very poor image of himself in, in spite of his family background. He's just a bloke. He's not even trained in the army. Nobody has ever trained him. He's not an, inter he's not an intellectual. He's not intelligent. He's not even big. He's small. He's somebody who would, hide be who would hide behind the rocks and hide in the cave. You have to understand that when, call when God calls you, He empowers you. When God calls you, He anoints you. But you have to see yourself in the sight of God. You have to stop seeing yourself with the eyes of the natural. The eyes of the natural will keep you small. The eyes of the natural will keep you inferior to your surroundings and to your environment. The eyes of the natural will keep you inferior to what God has for you to do, to God's destiny and future for you. That's why whenever God called, whenever He called Moses, he said, come up. Whenever God called Joshua, he said, come up. Come up, come up, come up, come up. Come, come up to the prayer mountain. Come up to pray. Come up in your Christ consciousness. Come up to see who you are in Christ Jesus. Your natural self will drag you down. The law of gravity pulls you down. But the reason why the plane can lift up, the reason why the plane can soar in the sky is because they operate by the law of lift. God can lift you up. He can lift you up out of the natural. He can lift you up out of your limitations. He can lift you up out of your inadequacy. Your sense of inadequacy will always talk to you. 
You will always hear the voice of inadequacy talking to you. You are not smart enough. You are not clever enough. You are not good enough. You are not holy enough. You are not righteous enough. You haven't prayed enough. You haven't that enough. You are not good mother. You are not good father. You are not this. You are not that. You are not that. You have to stop it in the name of Jesus. That's why the Apostle Paul, he said, it's no longer I that live. Can we say amen? It's no longer I that live. Who I am is irrelevant. It's who Christ is. Can we say amen? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So God said to Gideon, he said, I will be with you. He said, surely I will be with you. He said, I'm the smallest in my clan. I'm small. I'm nobody. I mean, I'm small. I mean, I'm small. I'm nobody. I'm stupid. I've not been trained. I've not been to uni. I can't do this. I can't do that. You know, how many of you have ever experienced when God asked you to do something and you said, no, 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 not me, not me. How many of you have ever experienced that? I have. I have. To China? No. To China? How can I go to China? Are you sure? Chinese is my least, least favorite subject. <laughs> When I was in high school, I hated Chinese. I tell you, I hated it. I hated it. When it's time for my Chinese lesson, you know what would I do? I would take off my watch, I put it on my desk, and I say, I have another half an hour to go. And I would look at my watch every five minutes. So when God said, go to China, you must be joking. Speak Chinese? I don't know how to speak Mandarin. Uh, my, my Mandarin people will laugh at me. But God said, I've sent you. And uh, you have to understand that when I got saved, I read my English Bible. I did not read my Chinese Bible. You must be joking, you know. Read the Chinese Bible? No. Oh, the thousand shows in Chinese. I love the thousand shows in, in King James because I'm an English literature major. <laughs> but not the thousand shows in Chinese. <laughs> but whoever God called, he anoints. And for whatever reason, the Chinese Bible starts to talk to me. And I remember I rang up Pastor Winnie. I rang up uh, Auntie Winnie. I said, could you please get me a Bible in Chinese from Hong Kong? <laughs> and then the Bible starts talking to me in Chinese. Before that, I thought God only speaks English. <laughs> God is awesome, so you don't you worry. Whatever He calls you to do, He will give you the power to do it. Can we say amen? amen? Hallelujah. So don't look at yourself. Don't worry. He will make a way. Hallelujah. Amen. He will make a way for you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. He will make a way for you. He'll make you the best mother in the world. He'll make you the best father in the world. He'll make you the best wife, the best husband, the best businessman, the best doctor, the best, the best, the best, the best. Because God has no, nothing but the best. The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from above. So everything that God has is best and perfect. Can we say amen? And then let's look at the scriptures again. You know, when God said to Gideon, God said, I've sent you. And what did he say? He said, surely I will be with you. Can I ask you to read that together with me? One, two, three. Surely I will be with you. So all that matters, everything is unnecessary but the presence of God. The presence of God is what will promote you. The presence of God is what will make you a success. The presence of God is what guarantees your success. Is the presence of God. I want you to understand that the Bible is awesome, you know, from Genesis to Revelation. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, God had to cover them with the blood of the animals. You know, you look at David's sacrifices. Animals, animals, blood, animals, blood everywhere. You look at Solomon's temple, you think that it's so grand, it's so awesome. I mean, if you were alive in those days, all that you could see was just a pool of blood. Animal blood. 
You could never get into the presence of God without the blood. Without the blood, because the blood looks forward to the blood of Jesus. The blood of the animal covered them. I mean, they had to be covered, because if they were not covered, and God came close, they would all pop, 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 die. Nobody can stand the presence of God and live. So they had to be covered by the animal's blood in order to have God's presence with them. They needed God's presence. That's why they had to be covered with the animal's blood. Because what distinguished them from the other people of the world was the presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant is what made them successful. I mean, the rest of the world saw them coming and they trembled. The Old Testament was God speaking to them. God speaking to them from a distance. God speaking to them from a distance. From a distance. You know, the people, they were so scared of God, they said to Moses, don't ask us to come close to God. You hear God and you come and tell us. Because they have seen even cows died in the presence of God. There was this person who was just trying to, you know, fix the Ark of the Covenant just to stable it a bit. And what happened? Chum, he died. It's not that God killed him. But holiness killed sin. And sin was in the man. And because sin was in the man, the man died. So in the Old Testament, it was God speaking to them. It was speak, God speaking to them. But God's heart is not just to speak to you. God loves us so much. God loves us too much to, to be in a distance. How many of you love to hug people? How many of you love hugging people? Lift up your hands. Come on. How many of you love to hug those that you love? Come on, lift up your hands. There is there's something special about hugging and embracing, isn't it? There's something about physical intimacy because it expresses your love, that closeness. And so what happened? God came as Jesus. The Word became flesh and dwelled among us. God came in the form of a man to live in the midst of men. God came in a human form and he was able to touch people. He was able to touch people. He was in the place where he could be touched, where he could be felt, where he could be heard, where he could be talked to. That's Jesus. And what's the name of Jesus? Emmanuel. God is with us. So the distance was breached from to to with. Amen.